Today we're going to talk about the ascension, the ascension of my wonderful, marvelous Jesus. He is the King of Kings. The ascension is a coronation. It's your job on earth regarding redemption. It was finished on the cross and uh, the earth scorned you. They put a mock title up there, King of the Jews, but guess what? Could not have been more accurate. He is the king, not only of the Jews, he's my king. He's the king of every Gentile. He's the king. He's the king of kings. And uh, the ascension I want to talk about today because it triggers so many things. It seems like a very simple act and there's not a whole lot given to it in scripture. But when you realize what it triggers off, First of all, let me tell you that it was expected, okay? David, who wrote Psalm 68, it is a Psalm of David. In uh, verse 18, he says, Thou, speaking of the Messiah, hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. Uh, you might think, that sounds a lot like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Uh, Paul is not quoting there, uh, He's actually teaching from it. He goes on and talks about some of the gifts in particular that were given during uh, that time. But one of the things I want to point out is this is a coronation, okay? This is, uh, he got the scepter. He's got the scepter back. The scepter is now in his hand. He is the Lord of lords. It will not depart from out of his hand, okay? Let me give you a prophecy. Israel, when he was old, he was dying and he had all his children gathered around him. And uh, he was speaking prophecies over them. And when he came to, this is in Genesis chapter 49, when he came to his son Judah, he said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Who is Shiloh? Shiloh means peace. Shiloh is the Messiah. And he's given a messianic prophecy. He's saying, Judah, you are going to hold authority, you're going to have power, you're going to uh, be able to exercise dominion until the time that the Messiah comes, then you're going to have lost it. All right, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between your feet until Shiloh come. When Shiloh comes, you're not going to have any power. You're not going to have any power at all. Let me give you a brief history here. The Jews had been led off into captivity n uh, numerous times. One was the Babylonian captivity. In this captivity, the Jews, excuse me, they kept their autonomous legal authority. Uh, imagine bringing a people in a captivity that had like 614 diverse ordinances, uh, volumes of Talmudic writings and all kinds of things like law, law, law. These are really legal people have to do things. And so the Babylonians basically said, See to the law yourself. You keep, you deal with your own people according to your own customs and laws, all right? And the Medo-Persians, uh, Persians, when they were in that captivity, the Jews still kept autonomous legal authority. They could, uh, they could execute a Jew themselves. It broke the Jewish law. Excuse me. Even under Alexander the Great, the Jews kept autonomous legal authority. And under Greek domination, the same thing. The Jews always kept their legal, their autonomous legal authority. They kept the scepter in their hand until Rome. Rome did not let the nations that they were dominating or occupying uh, regulate or use their law, period. Romans had their own law, and this was going to be the law of the land and of your country now. So the Jews lost autonomy, uh, legal autonomy and authority. In other words, <clears throat> at the time that Jesus came, the scepter had departed out of Judah. It was gone. So guess who shows up? Shiloh. This is why... This is why Jesus was sentenced under Pontius Pilate. He was actually convicted by the Jews in the court. You remember Caiaphas asked him, adjured him by God to say who he was and are you the son of God? And Jesus was, under Jewish law, he was accused of blasphemy. But blasphemy didn't work under Roman law. You could say whatever you wanted. It doesn't mean it was a free society. 75% of the, uh, of the uh, Greek population or the, the, the Roman population were slaves. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I've got this chest thing. Uh, uh, but Jesus was taken to Pilate because the Romans 
had to put him to death because the Jews couldn't do it. Remember in John chapter 8, they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus, and they said, Moses in the law commands that she be stoned to death. What are you going to do? Well, he couldn't break Roman law. Uh, that was a setup. That was a thing. And, uh, of course, so Pilate, he heard that... Uh, uh, Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. He knew the Jews had delivered him for envy. And Pilate, when he heard that we have a law, and by this law, he made himself the son of God, so he needs to die. Uh, the Bible says Pilate became more afraid. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Okay, his wife had dreams about Jesus. Don't touch this, this just man. Uh, but the Jews cried out, and this was a little switch here. If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whosoever makes himself um, a king speaks against Caesar. So what's the king stuff? Well, Jesus said he was, uh, you know, art, art thou a king? And he said, thou sayest. And they gave him the king of kings title. And they, you, could, uh, you, you could say you were God or the son of God, but you couldn't make yourself a king. Caesar didn't like that. That was too much of a threat. That was actually considered treason. But under the whole incident, Jesus regained the scepter. And I'm talking about the ascension. This is a coronation. This is a crowning. Crown him king of kings, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, he had regained the scepter. Well, not regained. He had taken it. It was his. And um, regained, I'm not just talking about civil law. All supreme moral law is in his, in, in his control. Um, not just for the Jewish people, but for every language, every nation, every person on earth now. Jesus is king of kings. Not just the human beings, but also to all the creation, the thrones, the powers, the principalities, um, holy angels, fallen angels, demons. Jesus is the, the Lord of Absa. He is the supreme king. And I might also say that it's not just for here and now. It's also for the world to come. That means he is forever, ever, ever a king. So the coronation we see in the ascension, we see the coronation of the king that earth scorned him, quite frankly. They mocked him, made fun of him, ridiculed him. Um, bad choice. <laughs> he is the king, absolute king of kings. Now, why did he go through all this stuff? Why was that permitted? Well, uh, even if, if a person is a prince or a son, um, they, they go through a transitioning period. A prince is still a king. He's just a king in the future, okay? Uh, Jesus learned things. Um, he learned and he suffered. He went through that transition. I don't mean in empirical knowledge sense or even a spiritual knowledge sense. But let me say this, that Hebrews puts it like this. Um, now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, he differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. He is under uh, tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Okay, in Hebrews, in the fifth chapter, the author, who I hold as Paul, by the way, uh, says that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So we see the suffering of Christ on the earth. He was mocked, he was scorned, but now in the ascension, it's this guy, it, this is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And he's being seated on the right hand of God the Father, not by men, but by God the Father himself is seating him at, at the right hand, okay? So he's being ascended. The ascension releases so many things. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit, it, it was made possible, okay? Um, the, the situation of Jesus Christ has been totally reversed. He's now king. He's giving gifts unto men at the ascension, and here comes the Holy Spirit, okay? And Jesus said in John 16, 17, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, that means imperative, necessary, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So the Comforter, what's that? What? Why? Why? Why didn't Jesus just stay here in the flesh and, you know, hang out and eat broiled fish and honeycomb <laughs> with his disciples and us, you know, and help us out when we have problems? Uh, uh, Jesus, this is the birth of the church. Jesus is going to be communicating not just one-on-one, -on -one, not just with the room full of guys who are locked behind doors because they're afraid of uh, the Romans and the Jews and all this stuff. They, they, this is... Jesus is now going to share his heart with the entire 
body of Christ across all distance, across all space, all right? Across, he's going to go beyond understanding with your natural mind. We're moving into, into the Holy Spirit now for the entire church to know his heart, okay? And uh, this way he can continue, and he does continue in communication with us. Remember the foot washing there? Uh, in John in the 13th chapter, it says that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hand and that he was come from God and went to God, okay? Think of that for a minute. Don't lose that. Jesus knows I'm leaving. I came from the Father. I'm going back to the Father. What does that prompt him to do? And I have to take it in context. He rises from supper, lays his garments aside, takes a towel, girds himself, and after he poured water into a basin, he began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded, the scripture says. And this means that Jesus cares for the church. I'm going to play a little, you know, game here. Um, I'm going to say that his disciples are his church. They're the body of believers. And I'm going to draw an allegory here that Jesus still washes our feet. He still cares for us. He still is the servant of the church. You know, that's exactly what this message was. Peter said, no, wait a minute, the servant, you've got this backwards. I'm supposed to be down there and you're supposed to be seated here. And Jesus said, no, you don't get this yet, okay? Uh, it, servanthood is the other way around. He who serves is the chief, is the head. And uh, if you don't let me serve you, then you don't have any part with me. And then Peter says, no, no, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus is calming him down. Yeah, that's enough. If I wash your feet. What I'm saying is this, the care of Christ to the church is perpetual. All right. He's still washing our feet. This is, he loves us. He's concerned for us. Um, and he couldn't do this one at a time. That's why the Spirit came. So now all the thing about, well, I'm in the United States and you're in Peru and he's over in Israel and this one's in the Middle East. And, you know, Jesus can care for all of us because the Spirit has come. And this is a fabulous gift. And even though the psalmist, which I originally read the text, that God gave it to the Christ, he gave it to the Messiah, uh, let, let me give you a little bit of story there on, uh, on David when he was king of Israel. I think First Samuel, about chapter 30, Ziklag has been sacked and the men have lost everything. Some people came in, some robbers, and they took, uh, they took the women, the children, the goods, and David has got a band of men, and he's going across to recapture uh, what, what's his. But he gets to this brook called Besor, and uh, there are 200 men that just, they don't have it. They, can't, they say, David, I'm sorry, we just cannot get across we don't have enough strength. We're tired. We're weak. And so David took the rest of his men and went across and uh, they kicked the fire out of these people. And uh, they, took, they took back their women, their children, their wives, and all their goods. And they came back to these 200 men at the, at, at the brook Besor. Well, some of the men who were with David, the scripture says they were wicked men, men of Belial, um, of those who went with David. They said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Saved every man, his wife and his children, that he may lead them away and depart. They weren't going to share. Okay. And David says, you shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us, who hath preserved us. He has delivered the company that came against us into our hand. Uh, for who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff, and they shall part alike. And so from that day forward, he made it a statute and a statute and an ordinance in Israel uh, unto this day, the scripture says. So in other words, Jesus was our mighty man. He was the one that went and he descended and he grabbed and he fought and he won and he rose victorious and he has been honored by God the Father, but he's going to share it with us that just didn't have the what it took to get it done, okay? He gave gifts unto men. They call them ascension gifts.
and Paul is teaching on this. I say teaching because I don't want to say Paul is quoting because he doesn't really finish it. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And uh, Paul talks about these. By the way, one of the things, they commonly call this in certain circles a five-fold ministry. It's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher is in the Greek. They're joined together by the conjunction, okay? Uh, some pastors and teachers. So a pastor is a teacher. They're not two different people. Um, if, if you're a pastor, you're a teacher. Okay, and but the reason of this is for the perfecting of the saints, apostles, prophets, evangelists. These are these are functions within the church that, you know, what what Paul didn't say was here. Uh, here was it. It was for the heathen uh, or for the rebellious. Well, what better gifts could be offered than uh, uh, than apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers? Uh, for the perfecting of the saints. Why? So that we can share this gospel with the outside world, with these people who are rebellious. Why does God want to dwell with the rebellious? He wants to love them. He wants to give them an opportunity to give themselves to Christ, okay? Uh, so that they can, um, so that they can dwell with Him, and God can, you know, be their God, and uh, that they can be their people. So that's another reason for the ascension: is that the gifts that were given. Another reason for the ascension, which is, uh, wow, I am so thankful. In Hebrews chapter four, it says, "Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens." Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold fast our profession. And uh, he says, For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, uh, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For us. Why is Jesus in the presence of God? One of the reasons is for us. Okay? Uh, that means that um, it's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So what better intercessor could somebody have? Jesus in his ascension has become our intercessor. Another thing, he is also a thing, person, function, whatever, I don't know what to call it, but he has become... Um, he is our baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Okay, remember John was baptizing with water, and uh, he's recorded in Mark in the first chapter. He said, I, I indeed baptize you with water, but he that comes after me shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And Matthew was a little more descriptive. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, uh, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoe latchets I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay, so there's a Holy Ghost baptism. As a matter of fact, I think Luther wrote about six or seven different kinds of baptisms. In um, Hebrews 6.1, baptism, I know there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one hope of our calling. But in baptism, Hebrews is very clear that there's a plurality of experiences that you can have in this baptism. Okay, but John, John makes it very clear. He says... Um, uh, now the Lord knew that, that the Pharisees have heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. He's just giving a narrative in verse 1. But in verse 2, he puts in parentheses, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Okay, so Jesus, who is obviously, by John's word, the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, um, he is because he's ascended. He can do that now. He never baptized anybody down here on earth. And that in John, I think, 4, 2, or by 4, 3, it says, and he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So another thing we see in the ascension is that it is physical. I mean, this is a real physical body, okay? When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, uh, and a cloud received them out of their sight. Singular cloud, not clouds. I'll touch that in just a minute. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men uh, stood by them in white apparel, and they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus. That's significant. It's a physical Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so sh shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. So uh, go into heaven. So Jesus has been taken up. This is his ascension. And um, I just want to point out something that's 
um, something that I think is really neat, okay? In Exodus 13, 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. He led them away uh, in night by a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So there was a cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire by night that led the children of Israel as they crossed the Red Sea, okay? And uh, they went through this. And let me say that Paul mentions this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, um, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Okay, cloud. Well, let me tell you that nephthale is the word. It's only, and it's not used in, well, yes, it's used in one other place there, um, where uh, that's the cloud that received Jesus out of their sight. It was a Shekinah. It was a cloud. It wasn't just a cirrus nimbulus or nimbus cumulus or whatever, you know, all those things are called. Uh, this is an actual uh, cloud that is the same word in Hebrew as the one that led them, that parted the Red Sea and went through. The children of Israel followed the cloud in the wilderness by day. It was the very awesome presence of God. And Paul is using the same word that's used by Luke in Acts chapter 1 there. As, as, as they looked up the cloud, the Nephile, it received him out of their sight. There is the other place in scripture where that, that type of cloud is used is when the disciples were with Jesus on the uh, Mount, what they call the Mount of Transfiguration. But Jesus uh, had a conversation with Moses and Elijah and Peter woke up. These guys were sleeping, but they woke up and they saw this and they were... Um, going to make three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you, Jesus, and a cloud overshadowed them and spoke to them, excuse me, and said, this is my beloved son in, in whom I am well pleased. This is the same word. It's the same nephthale. It's the same cloud uh, that is used here. Now, when Jesus does come back to earth, okay, in the second coming, um, we know that uh, he is going to come in the clouds of glory, but it's a, it's a different it's a different word that's used here, okay? Matthew 24, 27, he says, For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is going to be something uh, that's very, very, very visible. But Jesus' ascension, okay? The Son of Man has gone to the right hand of power, and he'll be coming back in the clouds of heaven. Uh Another reason, an additional reason for the ascension was that he has gone to prepare a place for us. Now, could he prepare it here on earth? I'm, I'm, I'm a little more excited about where he went to prepare the place. But in John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house um, are many mansions or many rooms. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, ye may be also. So one of the reasons additional why the ascension is such a, a wonderful thing is that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. Thank you.